What's up guys, it's Michael Morgan here from Lathrop High School and morganapteaching.com. I've got here another AP review video for you, but if you want to join over 90% of my students in passing the AP test, then check out the links below. I've got writing guides, review guides, instruction guides, and everything I know on how to help you pass the AP test. So feel free to check out my website, and if you find this video helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe. All right, period seven. So period seven is basically the early progressives uh, till uh, the end of World War II. So period... Seven, it's 1890 to 1945. This one's densely packed, so we'll go over it a little quicker because uh, there's just a lot of topics to cover. <clears throat> All right, so progressives, what the hell are progressives? So progressives are uh, liberals. There's kind of two kinds of uh, liberals, essentially. Progressive liberals and then classical liberals. Classical liberals and progressives both believe in um, freedom and democracy. But the, the kind of difference here is progressives, progressives believe in a little bit more intervention by the uh, government. Meaning the government gets involved in the economy a little bit more. Uh, usually, at least, at least in the 18, you know, 90s and early 20th century, their purpose wasn't to intervene so much on behalf of uh, people, like the later Democrats will be, uh, to try to like, you know, redistribute wealth and that sort of thing. But they were very much anti-corruption, anti-monopoly. So they were more so there to ensure monopoly stayed broken up and ensure competition. And they also did want to allow workers to at least protect themselves a little bit. So, you know, they wanted to legalize, uh, or at least later they wanted to legalize unions, but later became the Democrats. And uh, they definitely wanted to clean up the corruption that was occurring in the economy. So things like cleaning up workers' uh, conditions, maybe improving pay, depending on the situation, and then also they really want to combat crony capitalism. So there's some few tenets here. Uh, again, classical liberals really want to maintain laissez-faire, let the uh, economy run itself. Progressives wanted a bit more intervention. Um, so there's several things that define these guys. They are anti-monopoly, because monopolies, of course, don't have competition, so they can jack prices up and lower quality and get away with it. They were anti-corruption. So they were, for example, very much against crony capitalism, which is essentially when legislators and lawmakers work together with big business, they take bribes and favors, and they pass laws or grant land that favors the business who funded their campaign. It's illegal to, of course, bribe someone directly, although it does still happen, uh, but what they do and they do now is they donate to your campaign. And then since they donated, you know, whatever thousands or millions of dollars to your campaign, then you sort of kind of owe them a favor and pass policies that benefit those companies. So uh, they were very much anti-corruption uh, in that they were anti-crony uh, capitalism, which again is um, where businesses and legislators sort of work together collude, really. They misuse funds uh, and governmental powers. Um, an example of anti-monopoly is in 1890, they passed the uh, uh, Sherman Antitrust Act. And that sort of laid the foundation for breaking up monopolies and trusts. Um, so they would either work together as a monopoly or a trust or a cartel, meaning Either I bought up all the other companies and controlled the industry and jacked the prices up, or I just coordinated with other large companies in my same industry and we could work together to uh, jack up prices or, or lower quality, essentially. Uh, they're also very pro-science and pro-efficiency. <clears throat> as well as uh, they're going to be a bit more egalitarian, but... They're not really anti-segregation, we'll talk about that. Some progressives were opposed to it, some tolerated it, and some actually continue to support it. But they're very pro-science and efficiency, and um, there is a bit of a moral tinge to it as well. Um, so they were, I don't know how to phrase this, but they were morally driven. For example, you know, taking some momentum from the temperance movement, they were very anti-alcohol, uh, and they're going to get a lot of uh, pieces of legislation passed that are very anti-alcohol, including the uh, 18th Amendment, which banned it outright in the United States. Uh, and the last one, they're gonna be very pro, 
I guess you could say nature or naturalists. So I'm not saying that they're, you know, as nature loving as what you might think of as modern crunchy hippies, but uh, they are ones that sought to preserve or conserve the natural resources that we have. Because they realized that at this point, we were using things up at a tremendous rate with the uh, Industrial Revolution in full swing. So they are going to start focusing on uh, conservation, keeping what we have and maintaining it, or even preserving and you know keeping it pristine. So like national parks and things like that. All right, so that's kind of the general overview. We shouldn't skip anything, no, I didn't. Um, we could put social justice up here. Again, I'm not as, it's not as social justice as you might think now. Of course, social justice now is a bit out of hand. Uh, but again, they weren't all opposed to segregation, but they were more accepting or understanding of the idea of equality, especially when it came to class. Um, they're gonna pass several measures that attempt to take uh, a bit from the uh, ultra-rich or big companies and try to pass it on to the government uh, or poorer people. Not quite like the Democrats under FDR, but it's sort of a movement in that direction. All right, so some examples. I already gave you the Sherman Antitrust Act. Um, there is an example, it's a little bit, it's a little bit into near the end of the progressive movement in 1921, but a great example of crony capitalism was a thing called the Teapot Dome Scandal. This is essentially when a, uh, a member of uh, Warren G. Harding's cabinet uh, essentially granted an exclusive non-auctioned contract uh, to a company, you know, for bribes. And when they found out about it, um, he had to face criminal charges. And that was the first example uh, in U.S. history of something that blatant uh, and that large that was, that was caught and identified. So that did not help, help out <coughs> Warren G. Harding and his administration. Um, so that's an example of crony capitalism. If you're looking for one, it's a little later in it, but nonetheless, it's still an example. Um, one of the most, I guess you'd say, uh, the best representations of the movement itself, uh, he didn't fit all of these categories, but he fit most of them, was a guy named Teddy Roosevelt. He was a progressive and a war veteran, and he very much fit this, um, embodied this movement. So he's a pro-democracy guy, uh, but the thing that he's very much against are these top two, anti-monopoly and anti-corruption. In fact, he was known as the uh, trust buster, the one who was there to stir support against these large corporations uh, that had begun to exert a large amount of control of the economy uh, in a corrupt uh, manner, one that hurt the consumers. Because again, the point of capitalism is you compete with one another, so that the prices are low and the quality high. That helps everybody out. But if they're working together uh, or they're monopolizing, then that, that system doesn't work. So he wanted to preserve capitalism as he thought it, it should be carried out. Uh, we also have him, of course, being very pro-nature. Uh, pro he was big on uh, preservation and conservation. So he expanded the national park system. <clears throat> Like he did some hiking and camping with John Muir up in Yosemite Valley, um, got to see that. Um, national parks had already existed, but again, he vastly expanded them. One thing I should mention too is there's preservationists and there's conservationists. Both of these are technically pro-environment, but they have different attitudes. Preservationist means don't touch it, let nature be pristine and do its thing. Conservationists mean we use it, right? So we build dams, uh, irrigation systems, uh, things like that. But we're supposed to be realistic in that we can use it all up. So conservationist means accumulate and organize it for human use, but make sure that it's not depleting itself. Um, so for example, one piece of legislation passed uh, that was at least conservationist was the uh, National Reclamation Act of 1902. <clears throat> and this was a program and funding uh, for building construction of like dams and irrigation, especially in the West, because you had large populations forming in Southern uh, California, like in LA, and they lacked the waters to support that many people and farms. So they had to start diverting water from um, like the Owens Valley, which by the way now is a dry lake bed. Um, and they also started 
trying to tap into like the Colorado River and all kinds of stuff. So that was a, an attempt to use resources at a sustainable level. Um, obviously, in the case of Owens Lake anyway, it wasn't sustainable, they drained it. Um, but that is a step forward in not just clearing and, and destroying the land and trying to make sure it's a sustainable <clears throat> use of the environment. Uh, again, preservationists though, would prefer like would prefer that you don't people aren't using it or at least minimally using it. Okay, um, so that's the preservationist conservationist. Let's talk a little bit more about pro worker. So pro worker and pro social justice. That's going to we'll put worker in there social justice. An example of this would be how, and I think it was 1911. I might have the year wrong on that. They formed the Federal Department of Labor. And this is sort of an organization that's supposed to act on behalf of the working class in the federal government. And what I mean by that is there was a lot of uh, terrible practices going on at the time uh, with laissez-faire capitalism. One of the, of course, weaknesses of laissez-faire capitalism is if you don't involve yourself in the government, the companies will tilt towards uh, corruption. <clears throat> and that's just a natural occurrence of uh, well, human society. We've always known that. Uh, any hierarchy is going to tilt towards corruption over time, so we have to keep sort of trying to correct it. So, um, some of the people that were active in pointing out some of these uh, corrupt practices, like having dangerous working conditions, having unsanitary working conditions, having uh, uh, terrible hours. Um, one of the uh, examples of people that exposed these sort of injustices and, and corruption in the workplace uh, were, was the uh, book The Jungle, which you may have heard of, by Upton Sinclair. And that was a, how would I say this? An undercover look at a meatpacking factory. So they saw terrible, terrible practices like uh, the mixture of rat and rat feces into the meat, um, people losing pieces of their hands and body dying. There's even stories apparently of like people falling into the meat vats and just becoming part of it. Um, and they heard about these terrible working conditions, this terrible pay, um, and how unsanitary things were. And that book just took off. People got to see exactly how bad things could get. And that's gonna later result in the formation too of the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, which of course is a basically an inspection agency that goes in and makes sure that your company is um, up to par with uh, safety measures and um, health and regulations. So that way you're not poisoning your customers and harming and damaging your workers. So all those are part of this progressive movement to try to, to, try to fix things, make them more efficient uh, and less corrupt. There's a series of, because this was, this was a pretty, pretty wide sweeping movement. This wasn't just like Teddy Roosevelt. This was Roosevelt leading the charge, but lots of people even in Congress supporting it. So much so that they passed several amendments that are in line with these um, sort of, I guess you'd say fundamentals of the progressive movement. So we've got um, the progressive amendments of the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th amendments. So I'll just quickly tell you what each are. 16th, that is the federal income tax. It's a progressive income tax too. So for the first time, the federal government is going to, we did, there were a lot of opponents to this, uh, the federal government is going to progressively tax you on your income. So basically means the more money you make, uh, the more money you're going to be taxed. And uh, that is, I mean, we have lots of policies like that now, but that was a revolutionary addition uh, an intervention in the economy. <clears throat> 17th Amendment is going to be direct vote of senators. And you're like, how is that progressive? Before, senators were elected, again, just a reminder, senators are those that are elected to go to Washington, D.C. and make laws in the entire United States. They were voted for by the state legislators. So if you're in California, I didn't vote for a senator. The state legislators I had which was like basically the California Congress, voted for our senator. So it was much easier for companies to go in, uh, you know, through crony capitalism and essentially buy votes, send senators that are pro their company uh, to DC and get a lot of stuff done for them. Um, basically like political machines, which I think I talked about. Did I talk about political machines last time? Yeah. I did? Okay. Um, <clears throat> 
This is going to prevent, provide a way for a popular vote in the state. So again, instead of being able to bribe state legislatures and vote for senators that are, you know, in support of my company, now the whole state votes. Like, I can't bribe millions of people in a state. So it becomes much harder for crony capitalism to operate. Now, obviously it still can, you can still donate to the campaigns of those senators and things like that, but it's not as easy as buying votes uh, to get representatives that, that you like in office. So, that's the 17th, direct vote of senators. 18th Amendment is prohibition, they're gonna ban alcohol. Now this ends up becoming a disaster. Um, anytime you try to ban something that people like, it's just not gonna stick. So people, of course, we don't really talk about this much in a, a push, but just a quick summary. The 1920s, there's a huge bootlegging um, network going. Bootlegging is just illegal production of alcohol and consumption in speakeasies or secret bars. So we have organized crime all over the place. So then we have gangs fighting for territory to make and sell their illegal alcohol. Um, so then you have the huge crime wave of organized crime in the mafia and you know bootleggers like Al Capone and all of their corrupt practices. And the whole time, by the way, since they're buying and selling this stuff illegally, none of that is tax money. So the government is deprived of taxes on those sales. There's that, that crime going on underneath um, the uh, networks and fabrics of society. So it's just, it's just all bad. And eventually, we pass the 21st Amendment and take away prohibition entirely because it was a total failure. All right, lastly, next to the amendment. This is more along the lines of the social justice. After World War I, when women get a lot more involved in factories, uh, it becomes much more apparent in the West that women are very much capable of thinking and operating in society other than just you know operating at home. And they're going to uh, pass the 19th Amendment um, to grant women's suffrage. So that is the women's right to vote. That's first wave feminism, by the way. Suffrage. Again, first wave feminism is fighting for the right to vote. Uh, and at this point, Americans are ready to vote that in, especially after the, seeing the contributions of women to World War I. Uh, we have not had second wave feminism yet. Second wave feminism is women participating, first in opening up and participating uh, in the economy and politics. So that is gonna be second wave feminism in the 1960s. And again, the uh, leading causes for that are the birth control pill in the 1960s, as well as uh, lots of household appliances that basically take what would take most of a day to do the household chores can now be done in like one, two, or three hours. So that's really gonna revolutionize uh, women's time. And then of course, allow them to pursue part-time and full-time work or delay childbirth until they already have a career or education. <clears throat> All right, so that is, are those the basics on the progressive movement? I think I covered them all. Yes, and then we'll talk about segregation, at least under the progressives. Actually, we'll just talk about that right now. So, progressives were kind of split on segregation. Some opposed it, some tolerated it, some supported it, actually. So, uh, segregation. That's going to continue in the South, largely. And uh, most progressives are just going to sort of ignore it or tolerate it. So that is pretty much the, the status quo, is that they may believe it's wrong, but they also aren't going to really do much to fix it. Uh, they just kind of ignore it or tolerate it. However, some do oppose. So, for example, uh, Mary White Ovington starts the NAACP, all right? And that's the, uh, actually, the Association, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. So Mary White Ovington, <clears throat> NAACP. And they're going to begin fighting court cases uh, to try to stop some of the more notorious practices going on the time uh, in the South and in the North, but mostly in the South, like uh, lynchings, uh, things like implementing poll taxes and literacy tests uh, to try to keep blacks and poor whites from voting. Or a, a new group that's going to be coming in in mass is going to be uh, Latinos, Hispanic people. So they're going to try to get rid of those prejudicial practices and uh, open up voting to more than just uh, poor people. Or sorry, more than just uh, middle class and wealthy people. All right, um, so what else do I want to talk about with that? Oh yeah, there's also a book written in 1911 called Half a Man, uh, which sort of talked about the psychological tools segregation had 
on the black populations. Of course, feeling inferior, um, and nobody would want to be in a society in which they felt like they were a second-class citizen. Like, not even given an opportunity to show themselves and their ability, but just immediately prejudged based on their race or gender or whatever. So, half a man. Uh, however, so these are the ones that oppose. Some do support it, though, on uh, racial grounds. Some support. There's going to be a eugenics movement, a scientific eugenics movement. Obviously, these uh, policies have been disproven now, but at the time, a lot of scientists felt like whites were genetically superior. Uh, they thought they had some evidence from some of the work of Louis Termon on IQ, and they found that Northern and Western Europeans were the smartest people in the world. Um, and at the time they were correct, and it wasn't because, by the way, they were superior genetically, it's just because those countries were the first to stabilize and actually have um, compulsory education systems. So it's like, duh, they're gonna be smarter if they're all educated and um, they're well off. Right. And we've seen that in every society where those two factors have, have come in, and whether it's the United States or Canada or Western Europe, Northern Europe, or parts of Eastern Europe, or East Asia especially, has really taken off lately. Um, when they stabilize and when they implement um, compulsory education, IQs skyrocket, or at least increase. That's called the Flynn effect. Regardless, um, their science at the time, eugenics, they believed that um, blacks were inferior and they were okay with uh, keeping them separate in a way. That's what they believed. Obviously, of course, wrong now, we know that, but back then a lot of the science pointed that way. You had Yale professors and Stanford professors. Like I said, uh, Louis Terman was from Stanford. He invented the IQ test. He, of course, discouraged immigration from anywhere except Northern um, and um, uh, Western Europe. And who was the Yale professor? I wrote his name down, but maybe I didn't write his name down. There is a Yale professor, too. He was a famous one. I just forgot his name. Oh, well, I don't have it. Luis Termon works, though. He's the IQ test inventor, the Stanford Binet IQ test. All right, you cover him in psych. I think all of you guys, oh, all but one of you have had psych with me, so that name sure rings a bell. All right, uh, so that is the progressive attitude on segregation. We get on the progressive era? All right, okay. Uh, World War One. This one won't take that long, actually, because in A-Push, we don't really care about the details of World War One that much. Uh, so, due to several factors like alliance systems, imperial competition like the Moroccan crisis and the scramble for Africa, as well as, um, what was the other reason? Nationalism. Nationalism, the competition between nations, as well as Slavic peoples wanting to uh, achieve uh, self-determination and freedom. The powers of Europe are going to engage themselves in war between Austria-Hungary, Germany, initially Italy before they switch sides, and Russia, France, and Great Britain. So this is gonna be World War I. They're gonna be locked in trench warfare. It's gonna to be total war, where you, know, you dedicate your entire economy and society to the war effort. Uh, but the US is gonna be not involved until 1917. So let's talk about first how they're involved, kind of. 1914 to 1918 is World War I. And again, for those of you on the internet that uh, want to know more about it, I, I talk extensively about it in my AP Euro and AP World videos, especially the AP Euro videos. Because <clears throat> it's AP Euro, so obviously a European war is going to be highlighted, uh, especially World War I. So the U.S. doesn't get involved in 1917, but before we do get involved, uh, we are going to, of course, sell arms and supplies to both sides. We are also going to give uh, loans to both sides. Uh, especially as time goes on, though, more and more of that aid and loaning is going to just go to the Allied powers of Britain, France, and not as much Russia, but Britain and France. Later on, in 1917, Russia is going to have the Russian Revolution. We're actually going to support the non-communist side of the Russian Civil War. So, a lot of U.S. aid going at the time. Mensheviks. Yeah. Well, the Mensheviks, the Tsarists, and the... Um, uh, capitalists. All right, so Britain, France, Russia versus the Central Power, and Italy's going to join later, versus the Central, which is Germany, Austria, Hungary, Ottoman Empire later, and Italy before 1915. All right, so most aid by the end of the war is going to uh, Allied, and then of course when we join it, it's going to exclusively go to Allied. 
Um, so the question becomes, why did we join in on the side of the Allies? So we, we do identify with them more, especially the British, because we have common culture and language. Um, but a lot of the factors, that, several factors that contribute to this are going to be things like, uh, for example, the Germans anger us with their unrestricted U-boat or submarine warfare. They have these new um, devices. Well, it's not exactly new, but the first ones to use it in mass. Submarines that can sink the much larger British Navy, um, and there's no sonar at the time. So they are very much unable to see these submarines, and they just torpedo down their ships like, like crazy. So the uh, Germans operate here in the northern Atlantic, and they are sinking basically all ships that are not central power ships. That includes American ships. So if we're trying to ship people or goods, there's a good chance that, that those ships are going to be sunk in a lot aren't. One of those um, ships is the U.S. passenger ship, although they were actually stocking with military supplies, is the Lusitania in 1916. Now, we didn't like join the war immediately, but that's something that angered the American public. And it's going to make it much easier to do uh, when in 1917, the Germans realize that the United States is not going to help out them. So they send a telegraph, a note, to Mexico, trying to get Mexico to engage uh, in a war against the United States. And again, the purpose here is they want um, the United States to have to focus on its own territory and not send aid to the Allied forces. So that's known as the Zimmerman Note. The British intercept that, give it to U.S. intelligence, and, uh, well, there's no CIA, I should say intelligence, but the U.S. government, and that is going to be one of the leading factors in us entering the war on the side of the Allied powers. Now, when we get there, um, our soldiers are unexperienced, so we kind of um, play the fool for a while, but the fact that this war has been going on for so long in Europe, and their resources are so depleted, and their their populations are depleted. Like, pretty much everybody aged 16 to 41, uh, males, they had, they are already in service or dead. Uh, so you're seeing increasingly large numbers of, like, really young and really old men on the central power side, uh, as well as on the allied power side. So the influx of thousands of fresh American troops is just going to be too much for the Germans to hold off on their own. <clears throat> so even though Russia actually drops out in 1917 for the Bolshevik Revolution. Now, if you hear we talk about that, it's actually the Russian Revolution because you have one in February, which is the non-communist revolution, then again in October, which is the Bolshevik or communist revolution. But we only care about this Bolshevik revolution because Russia, which is massive, becomes communist, the first communist state. <clears throat> so they drop in 1917, but uh, Germany is not going to be able to hold on to this. Uh, one thing I should mention that the Europeans are already doing and the Americans lightly start engaging in is again total war so the total war is kind of two things it's focusing your entire society towards the war effort meaning factories are converted to war production um, resources are going to be rationed so that you can use them for the war effort so things like copper fuel um, food are going to be rationed uh, so that civilians are only using a small amount and the rest can go to the military but it also is going to mean um, they need more workers, because a lot of the men are going to go off to war, and that workforce is going to come from what population? Factories. No, they're going to factories, but if men are at war, who's going to be largely, yeah, women are largely going to join the factories. So, a couple things here. Um, all society geared to war effort. It's the first industrial war. <clears throat> And by the way, it's also the first war we discovered we're very good at creating weapons and killing each other, as well as propaganda. So again, this is where we get women in the workforce. We have rationing of goods. We have the draft, meaning you have compulsory military participation. Uh, and factories are re-geared for military purposes. And of course, propaganda. Propaganda means... You try to convince people that you are the side of good and the enemy is the side of evil. So there's a lot of posters and radio, well, not radio, but there's a lot of posters and clips and things like that of like trying to make the Germans look evil, like monsters, like rapists, things like that. Uh, and then, of course, we are the side of good that's there to stop them and their imperial aggression. So 
That is Total War, and we also get involved in that. <clears throat> World War II, it's going to be a lot more intense, uh, but this is the start of Total War in Europe for sure, and then it's our first engagement with it as well. So, once we get in there, a tired Germany does not have much chance with a fully functional, untouched uh, American economy and military. So, um, in 1918, <clears throat> the German forces are going to have to surrender. And that's what happens. So, there's a post-war conference, a peace conference, <coughs> held in Versailles, France, which is by and now part of Paris. And a peace treaty is going to be made. It, of course, was the one of the worst peace treaties ever made, because it basically just punishes Germany. But we don't care much about that. We can sum it up as it put a massive debt <clears throat> and set of punishments and reduction of military on the Germans, which they're going to fight to reverse in the 1920s and 30s. And you all know who Hitler is, so he's going to really come in and fill that role. Um, before the treaty, though, and during, uh, Will's, President Wilson of the United States is going to be a big proponent of several things. He's a big proponent of lazy for capitalism. The thing I want to focus on is two things. And that is, well, his 14-point speech, two of the points I want to focus on, <clears throat> we'll make it three. He really likes laissez-faire, capitalism, and hey, we know it works when there's a proper amount of intervention to prevent mon monopolies, crony capitalism, etc. Works very well. He's pro laissez-faire, but also we care about self-determination. He's a big proponent of self-determination, which means people choosing and running their governments how they want to. So not controlled by other ethnicities, things like that. Uh, he's also going to be a big proponent of the League of Nations, which of course is a the first like international organization dedicated towards maintaining peace. What are there two ways of maintaining peace? You guys know this. Economic sanctions. Economic sanctions, right. So if somebody's not, if a country is being aggressive, instead of going to war, you can have multiple countries in this organization reduce trade with that country. That's going to affect their economy negatively, and over time, they're much more likely to comply peacefully. So like if they're invading a country, instead of starting a war over it, you could just cut off trade with them in certain industries or entirely. Uh, that'll hurt their economy, and they're more likely to back off and um, cooperate with the rest of the world. There's the other one to have, like, when there's, like, two people conflicting or, like, yep. about to argue with each other, like, two countries in a sense. Right. They have someone to, like, mediate. Yeah, so a, a, an unbiased third party. So if, like, Germany and France are arguing, uh, one country wouldn't care is probably Canada. So you might have... Diplomats from Germany and France meet with a Canadian mediator, and they would try to settle their dispute that way. Because having two people that despise each other, it's really hard to have them settle their conflict. But you have a third party in there, like a therapist, or in this case, another ambassador or diplomat. It makes it a lot easier to negotiate and, and see the, the whole perspective, or both perspectives of the whole story. All right, but ironically enough, the League of Nations, the U.S., despite it being their idea, is not going to join it. Uh, the Senate, which of course is the one that ratifies and approves treaties and our participation in them, or organizations, is going to be remain true to American isolationism. So Senate denies entry into League of Nations. And that is because they are still going to be pro-isolationist. <clears throat> The reason why Americans didn't join the war, or they waited so long to do it, is because America has taken a very anti-European stance, meaning we just don't want to get involved in European affairs, because they're, at this point, they control most of the world, they're always squabbling and fighting and competing, and uh, we just want none of that. We are wanting to adhere to our old Monroe Doctrine, which is, this is the Western Hemisphere, Europe stay the hell out, that's our backyard. Like, if there's problems, we'll handle the problems. You don't, you have no right to be here. All right, that's essentially what the Monroe Doctrine is. And that's why they did this because they want to protect all of these uh, new nations that formed up in the 1820s and 30s um, that broke free from like Spain and Portugal and France and places like that. So they want to protect those. And uh, they did not care what Europe did in the rest of the world for the most part. 
They want to protect the uh, Western Hemisphere. So the United States can be very isolationist. In fact, that is a good segue to the next portion here, which is anti-imperialism. <clears throat> so like I just mentioned, in you know, the last 30 or 40 seconds, is that the United States is not involved in imperialism in Africa, Asia, <clears throat> or Oceania. We are just trying to protect and economically imperialize uh, Latin America and the Western Hemisphere on our own. So, some reasons why we're anti-imperialism. <clears throat> One is, I have three here, I'm going to make sure I get them right. Well, of course, self-determination, I already mentioned. We do enjoy self-determination. We like the idea of countries choosing their own governments uh, and sticking to it. That's why we've respected, for the most part, the new countries in Latin America. We are going to engage in some uh, corporate economic imperialism, like <clears throat> using fruit companies, for example, to bribe governments for good land and low labor costs and things like that. And that's not right. But we are at least going to respect their sovereignty as far as how they run their country. I mean, you can argue we don't, because again, we're funding and paying for their leaders and keeping them in power, but I guess it's really not much different. But it looks different on the outside, because we're not controlling their country directly. So, self-determination is one reason why we're not engaging in imperialism in the old world. We want people to sort of have their own uh, governments. Um, also, too, we, uh, as part of this eugenics movement, which I haven't talked about yet, we basically think that at the time, whites were superior, and we don't even really want to mix in much with the rest of the world. <clears throat> uh, again, there's going to be a movement in the 1920s especially, known as the eugenics movement, and that is basically hereditary and gene improvement, where they want to encourage the reproduction of superior humans, so those who are athletic or smart. Um, of course, their focus is on Western and Northern Europeans, whites, um, but they want to promote the, I guess you'd say, breeding of those, those groups, and they don't want the, to intermix their genes with uh, quote-unquote inferior humans. Did you say racial theories? Yeah, racial theories. This is where, like, for example, we start trying to sterilize criminals mm -hmm. and people who have low IQs, and we try to stop immigration from countries that don't have high IQs, which at the time, again, is pretty much just... If you're not Northern or Western Europe, we, we, we don't want you. And again, we know this is wrong because we know the IQ data back then was flawed, but that's what they thought at the time. All right, so anti-imperialism because of self-determination, we want people to choose. Racial theories, we didn't want to intermix much with other countries. Um, but also, we just had that tradition of isolationism, isolationist tradition. So, we are going to be directly isolationist, but we are going to be still active diplomatically. And what I mean by that is, we're going to encourage Europeans to not imperialize the world. So here's what I mean by that. In the 1890s, when Europeans are taking advantage of the Qing Dynasty, and essentially carving it up, at least economically, not directly, they're not conquering it, but they are operating their factories and companies and, and trade ports and ignoring all Qing, uh, Qing Chinese regulation and law, the United States is going to encourage an open door policy, or the open door policy, meaning respect China's government and keep it open to trade for everybody. They did not want, like what happened in India, where the British have sole control of India and their markets. They did not want to see that happen to China. They wanted to keep trading with China and East Asia. So we have our open door policy, or at least our proposition for it, uh, to keep China open. Open and, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Sovereign, there we go. In control of their own government and people. Now as you guys know from Euro and World, the British are illegally selling them opium and other drugs and things like that, not respecting their laws, customs, traditions, taxes, etc. Uh, but at the very least, the Qing government still exists until it's overthrown by its own people in 1911. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Other examples of anti-imperialism are going to be <clears throat> when Russia and Japan go to war in 1905 over the Manchurian railroads during the Russo-Japanese War. One of the people that helped settle, it, settle the treaty is actually Roosevelt himself, 20th U.S. president.
So we're actively, diplomatically, at least, trying to prevent imperialism or reduce imperial competition. Um, we also have an example with regards to the Monroe Doctrine. I, just to quick refresh, the Monroe Doctrine, I think it was 19, 1821. Monroe Doctrine. That essentially forbade Europeans from involving themselves in the Western Hemisphere. Meaning if they tried to reestablish a reassert colony, the United States would back up whatever the new nation was, like say it was Grand Columbia or something like that. Hypothetically, the United States would intervene to protect them from European intervention. So, <clears throat> since Europeans were still trying to collect debt from some of these faulting uh, governments, so for example, like if I'm a French or British or German bank or, or whatever, and I've given loans to, uh, well, I don't know, Venezuela, right? But they aren't paying back their loans. They believe they had the right to invade to recollect those loans. So it could be two things. They're not paying them back, or their government's unstable, so they can't pay them back. So the Europeans wanted to invade and occupy to enforce, collect their debts. The United States said, no, no, no. You can't do that inside of the Monroe Doctrine. In fact, they added to the Monroe Doctrine what's called the Roosevelt Corollary, which basically is adding a uh, amending a section to it. And this said no. It pretty much made the U.S. the police of the Western Hemisphere. <clears throat> so if you're having problems with stability or debt collection, you cannot invade. Guess who's going to do the invading and debt collecting? The United, States. the United States, right. And we do that, by the way. We did it like, like 50 times. Like, I can't remember the exact number. It's like, no, it was, I think it was 33 times from like 1920 to 1934, we invaded Latin American countries to stabilize them or um, for the purpose of collecting debts, essentially. So like, for example, um, I believe uh, in Hispaniola, which is half the Dominican Republic, which was owned by Spain, half Haiti, which was owned by France uh, previously, the Dominican Republic is going to be invaded and occupied by U.S. Marines for several years until 1924, and Haiti is going to be invaded and occupied by U.S. Marines for over a decade uh, until 1934 to stabilize them and collect debts and operate American and European businesses there. And again, this is known as economic imperialism. When you are using Western companies, international companies, to uh, operate through either supplying arms or funds to uh, native rulers to keep them in power so that your company can operate there cheaply and with the best land. All right, again, that's economic imperialism. So it's not really direct, but it's still imperialism. In fact, we, had, we uh, supported some pretty nasty dictators um, throughout the years. There's a guy, I can't remember his first name. His last name is Batista in Cuba. Terrible guy. Uh, blatant human rights violator, a dictator. But we supported him because he was pro-American. And he was pro-American because we gave him plenty of money and support. Um, that, of course, led to the Cuban Revolution, which we'll talk about later. We also did in Chile in 1971, in the 1970s anyway, maybe 73, where we support a, a brutal dictator named Augusto Pinochet to oppose the communist government that was going to end American company operations there. But that's, that's for period eight. We'll talk about that then. All right, lastly, this one is kind of direct. After the, um, after the Spanish-American War, we took former Spanish colonies in the Philippines, Guam, Puerto Rico. Uh, the Filipino people, who were already revolting against the Spanish, they thought that was independence for them. They're like, yay us, thanks Americans for your help. Except the Americans didn't leave, and they then ran the territory. So the Filipino people, for a few years, tried to actively resist the American presence there. Obviously they don't have the weapons or money to do that. Uh, but we do have what we call either the Philippine Insurrection or the Philippine-American War from 1899 to 92, 1902. Uh, of course, the Filipino people have no chance there. They don't have the industry, money, or people to do it. Uh, but they do actively resist in the name of self-determination, which is supposed to be one of our fundamentals, but we kind of ignore it when it doesn't benefit us. Or I should say we ignore it when it benefits us. You guys got that? Mm -hmm. All right, these are all general themes you have to know. like. Anti-imperialism. How are we anti-imperialism? You know, except for the actually being imperialist. But, um, <clears throat> you know, World War I, why weren't we involved? And why did we get involved? And what did that mean for our uh, uh, domestic economy and society? 
Um, how were we involved and why were we isolationists? Like those are the kinds of things you have to know about the early 20th century. Are we good? Yeah, under Roosevelt Corollary, does it say U.S. police versus what? Yeah, we basically become the police of the Western Hemisphere. So if things are going wrong in a country, they're not stable, they're not paying back their debts, etc. Mm -hmm. We're the ones that send our military to invade and stabilize them. <clears throat> What's the Russo-Japanese thing for 19? Russo-Japanese War? This is where we are actually active diplomats in settling imperial competition. So, like I said, Roosevelt went over there and I think he, I think he got the Nobel Peace Prize, don't quote me. Um, but, which is odd because he's a war hero, but uh, anyways, he went and settled and negotiated the treaty to end the Russo-Japanese War in 1905. Oh, fuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just kind of curious. Uh, what did Japan get out of the Russo-Japanese? Like, um, they got access to the Manchurian Railroad that they wanted. Mm -hmm. They basically took some territory from, or got rights to some territory that was disputed with Russia. Russia just got humiliated, almost overthrew the Tsar, and had to adopt this whole new um, political entity known as the Duma to uh, prevent the Tsar from being completely overthrown. Roaring Twenties. It gets its nickname because American business does so well. There's a few re reasons for that. Number one, a lot of the industrial centers in Europe were destroyed and the generations that ran them. Uh, so a lot of the production is going to shift to the United States. So we are going to amp up production. Europe's going to buy a lot of our stuff. So is Japan. Uh, so what we're going to have here is um, a lot of economic activity for the United States. We also have <clears throat> a lot of new technologies and techniques that help that out. So for example, Henry Ford invents the assembly line, which is the standard for um, all factories. And again, instead of people like individually building an entire car, <coughs> which takes a long time, you stand at an assembly station and pre-made <coughs> cars roll up and you just put on your piece essentially. So you know, it starts with the frame, goes down the line, and they just add parts. And you just add that same part all day, and it goes and goes and goes. That vastly increases the uh, production speed, reduces the cost, uh, allows workers to become specialized at their one task and become really good at it. Uh, so that's going to rapidly increase all production. We also have better machinery at the factories and on farms. Farms and factory, which mean, of course, that they can produce uh, quicker, larger quantities for cheaper. That's going to reduce the price of goods. So are people going to buy more or less if they're cheaper? Mm. They're going to buy more, right? So <clears throat> as time goes on, they increase production more and more, and we'll talk about how it becomes a problem later. Also, the United States is now uh, deeply involved in the distribution of credit, which is me borrowing money to pay for something I don't have the money for now. So like most people, when they buy a house or a car, they don't have you know, twenty to four hundred thousand dollars laying around. So they often borrow the money <clears throat> and pay it back over time with interest. This has never really been used large scale, like it is in the nineteen twenties, so people are going to abuse it. They're gonna use it to buy a lot of stuff right off the bat. There's a lot of new technologies they want too, like cars, radios. Uh this is sound odd, but it's actually a huge thing. Refrigerators. Telephones, etc. All of those things are going to be expensive initially and require credit to purchase. So people purchase them with credit and then they have a lot of debt. So once you get the stuff and you have a lot of debt, do you keep buying more stuff, generally speaking? No, generally speaking, you stop buying stuff once you have them and you have a lot of debt. So either you stop buying because you're paying back your debt or maybe you fail to pay your debt and you lose the stuff and you can't buy anymore anyway. So what happens is you have a huge spike in production and consumption, and then with this credit, prices get really high, people already have them, or they have trouble paying back their loans, so sales are going to decline, which is what happens towards the end of the 1920s. However, beginning to mid to late, <clears throat> it's going to be uh, a lot of economic growth. That's also going to uh, cause the stock market to rise very rapidly for the same reasons. As companies do better, their stocks become worth more, which is, again, is just pieces of that company. It's just split into tiny little fractions. So if I have a piece of a company like Ford and they're doing well, the value of that stock goes up. So people are very willing to buy these stocks 
watch the value go up and sell them for profit later. It's like a get rich quick sort of guarantee uh, in the 1920s because every company is just doing better for the most part. So stock market increases. Um, you also have people giving out credit to stock, uh, to buy stock. It's called margin buying or buying, buying on margin. That's where stock brokers lend you money to buy stocks. And of course the stock value raises, you, you sell it later and then you pay back the loan and you make the money off of it with money you didn't have. Of course the flip side is, if you borrow money to buy the stock and the stock does worse, not only do you lose your money, but you now owe somebody money, right? So all these are gonna mount up and they're gonna be good for a few years. You're gonna see the amount of stuff produced and purchased and the value of companies go up and up and up and up and up and up until it becomes inflated. The prices of stocks or goods or people's capacity to buy them and pay them back is going to um, maximize, and then we have the the crash portion, right? And that's going to happen in 1929, 1930, when the Great Depression occurs. <clears throat> but for most of the 1920s, it's just up. So you've got a lot of, of course, hedonism, a lot of spending that money, partying, dance culture. We also start having like early movies, <clears throat> silent films. There's no real sound yet. Uh, you start having celebrities too. There's enough money to, uh, for people to have spare time to go buy things, uh, participate in events, go to sporting events, professional sports becomes possible. You have like Babe Ruth and the Yankees and all that stuff. So professional sports. And again, people have the money to build these stadiums, uh, to buy the tickets, to buy the goods at them. Um, it's just the expansion of what is um, a culture we're familiar with now but it begins here in the 1920s because of credit and this uh, stock market and the increase in consumption. Uh, that's going to lead to a lot of these things developing. So a lot of these things, like I said, like movie stars, celebrities, like Babe Ruth, professional sports, that's gonna be largely started here in the 1920s because of the economic growth that occurs. You guys got that? Mm -hmm. All right. Because so many factories are opening up and financial institutions, uh, regarding stocks and whatnot, we're going to have what's called the Great Migration. In the late 1920s and 1930s, it's, it's a bit more of a 1930s thing, uh, but just know that the trend begins in the 1920s. So this Great Migration, that's really mostly 1930s, we'll say it goes 20s to 30s though, because it does start, is basically an urbanization movement. People are moving away from the country into cities. Why would they move to cities? What's there? More jobs, uh, economic Jobs, right. So it's jobs at factories. It's corporate jobs, you know, managers, clerical workers, telephone operators, all kinds of opportunities opening up in these cities that are becoming more vertical and interconnected with electricity and things like that. So there's lots of jobs available. And this also allows a lot of Blacks who are, you know, being discriminated against here in the South, whether it's segregation or lynching or poll taxes or whatever, they're able to migrate out of the South and to these northern cities like Detroit, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, uh, or even out West, although uh, not as frequently. And they're going to be moving uh, to these urban areas. So Blacks from South. And again, I just need to say this again, it starts in the 20s, but it really picks up in the 30s. And the 30s really picks up too, because there's a big drought in the farming centers of the uh, Great Plains. So you have a lot of people moving out of the Midwest to uh, either northern cities or to like, you know, California. Uh, in fact, a lot of them came from Oklahoma. So you've heard the term Okies. Those are the like Midwesterners that, specifically from Oklahoma, that came uh, during the 1930s. You guys heard the Dust Bowl? Mm -hmm. It's like a big famine, uh, or sorry, drought. I said famine, or I meant drought. A big drought in the Central Plains, which caused a lot of the topsoil that was held together by plants and trees and things like that, that they had you know, used for agriculture, that all died. So then it was just a bunch of you know, topsoil with no plants in it that was dry. And so it was very easy for dust storms to just take all that dust and move it around. So people were getting the hell out of there and going west to California uh, or to northern cities. So again, this Great Migration is a lot of blacks coming out of the South, as well as, of course, um, white farmers in the Midwest, white Midwesterners. All right, and then slash farmers. All right, so they're all moving, and we do have these large 
uh, people tend to f settle around um, where uh, people who have similar culture or appearance are uh, in enclaves. And that's going to be just as true here during the Great Migration. So what we're going to have here are, are boroughs or like basically like neighborhoods uh, inside of large cities. Like for example, you guys are like Brooklyn, Harlem, Queens, Manhattan. Those are all New York City, but those are boroughs of that city. Um, you're going to have, uh, for example, in Harlem, a lot of uh, blacks are going to settle there. Blacks settle. And we have what's called the Harlem Renaissance in the 1920s which is a, like a reinvigoration of black culture. So you're gonna have famous people like Langston Hughes, who's a, and he did a lot of things, <laughs> poet, novelist, the list goes on, playwright, uh, and he's going to produce a lot of very characteristic uh, African-American, it's not just African-American though, it's like a nuanced, Southern black mixed with northern city sort of uh, tale. Because a lot of these guys are coming from, uh, you know, the south, like New Orleans. So, like, things like jazz are going to become popular, which is basically a mix of the blues plus uh, ragtime sound. That's going to be popular in the 1920s among whites and blacks. Oh, Frederick Hughes, a novelist, playwright, poet. A huge list there. We also have things like a, an amalgamation of a lot of works, black literature, poetic, um, and other art forms of art, uh, put together uh, in essays by Elaine Locke in a uh, periodical known as The New Negro. And that's gonna be uh, used to, get, to put together a lot of that, of course, uh, black cultural literature, uh, music, and whatnot. So that's going to be a big um, theme here in the 1920s, is the growth of like a consumer popular culture, as well as this migration to the cities uh, for blacks and other farmers. And then we're going to have the Harlem Renaissance form and sort of, I guess you could say, consolidate and develop a lot of, or reinvigorate a lot of black culture, sort of mixing that southern uh, culture along with the uh, rural and the, or the urban north. This is blues and ragtime. Yeah, jazz is a mix of blues and ragtime. Uh, those are two styles uh, of music. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's sort of kind of how people have analyzed or assessed that jazz came to be. And then both of those are southern things. The blues and ragtime are like ragtime's like that kind of gibberish sounding stuff where they kind mm -hmm. of make up noises and sounds. And then. Uh, they mix that with the blues to have that sort of jazz sound. It comes out of New Orleans, if I'm, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. And then the thing under it, it says Blue Lodge. Who? It says the New Negro, but then... Yeah, Elaine Law, New Negro. Mm -hmm. So that's like a, an amalgamation of a lot of black works, essentially. So black literature, art, etc. Art, essays, books. Now, there are going to be race riots there later because they're going to claim that there's some still segregation issues and prejudice, but for the most part, this is a high point for black culture, especially at the time, uh, considering the uh, legal and discriminatory issues they had to deal with at the time. All right. Uh, blacks aside, though, there's going to be another group of people that are sort of, that don't identify with this. They see this as a very selfish, consumer-based, um, even evil movement. So you have a lot of alienated writers here that are going to be, you know, what was considered at the time anti-American. So writers that are, because this is very capitalist, like the consumer culture, the working hard, earning for yourself, you know, living lavishly sort of thing. Uh, you have alien writers that are more socialist or communist oriented, or they're just disillusioned with the uh, American dream. So I mean, if you go to a city, it's not just all parties and money. Like, there's poor people there, obviously. So, you have people that point that out. Uh, for example, there was a guy named um, H.L. Mencken. And, you know, I don't really care about his name. What you want to know, though, is the name is Periodical, which is the American Mercury. And it was very anti-American culture at the time. So he was essentially anti-consumerism, anti-small town, 
And there was one more I wanted you guys to know. Well, just basically anti-American ideals. He noted that there were a lot of people that were still unhappy, essentially, is what he's doing. All right. Uh, and also, too, we have a painter or a photographer uh, named Edward Hopper. And he's going to also paint a different picture of city life and this migration. So, for example, um, he's got a uh, work called Sunday, which, again, is, is, a, is a picture of an American city, which at the time are, you know, allegedly hopping with jazz and all sorts of uh, art and literature, as well as, you know, corporate financial and uh, business success and, and lavish living. Uh, he's going to paint the more, I guess you would say, bleak side of things. Like, for example, the Sunday is an image of a uh, poor old guy with his head down, like just sitting in the street with nothing. Right, so it's a very, very different image of what America is for some people as their continent. So several movements going on here at the same time. Uh, all of them, however, related to this rapid rise in economic growth and consumerism. So that is the goodish side of the 1920s. And again, I already alluded to the fact that this is all going to lead to a crash later, over use of credit, over spending, over production, etc. Um, but this is basically what the 1920s is as far as the better side of it. Are we talk about the bad side of it? Yeah. Besides the depression? All right, so there's a darker tinge to things. So it's one thing, I would say it's definitely a mistake to label anyone who is hesitant to open up immigration or at least wants to think about how to open it up as racist, which seems to be popular now. Like people that are reasonably trying to think about how to manage borders are just, they're attempting to label them as racist, but this is an example of anti-immigration that would be considered uh, racist. So in the 1920s, you had the eugenics movement, which I already referred to. And again, the whole point here is hereditary improvement. They only want smart, athletic, genetically superior people, quote unquote, breeding. And at the time, they think that's Northern and Western Europeans. And again, a lot, of, a lot of that's based on the IQ tests uh, from guys like uh, Lewis Terman from Stanford. Because uh, again, because Northern Western Europe are stabilized and have educational systems, of course, their IQs are going to be higher. However, the, at the time, they're not really going to analyze that much. They're just going to say, all right, these are the smart people. We want the smart people and not the other people. So a couple of movements here. They're going to try to discourage or sterilize criminals and the handicapped. Right. It's going to be a big part of the Nazi movement as well. Because that's how Nazis started. They started by sterilizing and imprisoning prisoners, physical and mentally handicapped. Uh, they targeted homosexuals as well. Mm -hmm. And they started expanding it to other races like Slavs and Jews and things like that. All right, we got our own here in the, in the United States. Um, they're also going to pass the Immigration Act. Um, I think it was 1924. Let me get the right here. Yep which is intentionally going to reduce all immigration that is not from Northern and Western Europe. That's who they want, essentially. So it takes the national populations. So it's looking at your country of origin here. So like if you're from Norway or Germany or Japan or India or wherever you're from. National populations of 34 years ago in 1890, and it's going to limit to 2% of the population at that time. So it goes all the way back to 1890, the numbers then, and says we're going to allow 2% from each country of whatever the population at that time was. So for example, say at the time there were 100,000 Japanese people in the United States in 1890, you would only be allowed 2,000 immigrants from Japan. So what this does is it's going to keep the numbers from Northern and Western Europe high, but it's going to actively discourage basically everybody else because what they didn't want was the new immigrants they were seeing. It's going to discourage or almost eliminate Asian immigrants. These guys with the Chinese Exclusion Act, they were like no Chinese here at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, they discourage Asian immigrants, Southern and Eastern European immigrants, 
as well as uh, Latin American immigrants, which are going to be coming in mass from Mexico starting the 1920s, especially with the economic growth we see here um, in the United States. And plus, the like, Mexican Revolution was still fresh, and there was still a lot of corruption going on down there. Uh, so a lot of migrants are going to be coming up for money and opportunity to work. Okay. So that's no bueno. You also have anti-immigrant groups beginning to revitalize. So the uh, KKK now expands to not just be anti-black, but they now expand to be anti-Jewish, anti-Catholic, basically uh, an anti-Asian, the uh, immigrants that they're trying to reduce or eliminate. <clears throat> so we're gonna expand to anti-Catholic, Jewish, Asian. Their numbers increase. They, of course, in the South are going to actively harass and even lynch more uh, um, blacks there. Now, I'm not saying like there were hundreds of blacks being lynched all the time, but there were there was a notable amount amount each month. I mean, like one is too many, uh, but if you're having multiple a year, that something's wrong. So, not a good thing. And it's the 1920s. What else do we have? Segregation is going to continue. We already know about that one. Let's so cover the eugenics movement, anti-immigration. And again, not the not the reasonable. Let's think about immigrants, but like the let's cut off all because they're um, genetically inferior. That's that's the racist kind of anti-immigration that one should oppose. Okay. Uh, oh, and lastly, the Red Scare. I forgot about that one. <clears throat> the first Red Scare. This one's not that huge of a deal, but it. I mean, it gets some people. Um, Punished, wiretapped, and uh, killed even, or jailed, perhaps unfairly. So, the Red Scare is American fear of communism. Perhaps irrationally. Americans fear communism because communism is very much the anti-American view. It's not it's anti-nationalistic, it's anti-capitalist, it's, it's pretty much anti-everything except for the fairness that America shoots for. All right, now, now we know communist regimes don't end up being fair. We've had, what, like scores of attempts at socialist communist regimes. None of them have worked, none of them have been fair. Uh, but that's the sphere behind it, allegedly. So um, Americans fear communism because one of the key points of communism is after you have the revolutionary phase, you guys remember from AP Euro and World, there's three phases. Revolutionary phase first, the working class rises up, takes the means of production and private property by force. Stage two is the socialist phase, right? Where that working class government is supposed to distribute them evenly to everybody, but also they're trying to foment revolution elsewhere because they want all countries to have this socialist revolution so that they can achieve stage three, which is the communist stage of no borders and sort of like syndicist, anarcho-communist uh, communes. Of course, we already have that. Just look at Slab City and see if you want to live there. All right, <clears throat> so again, American sphere communism because communism is trying to spread so, the area they fear the most is Eastern Europe because we have this 1917 Bolshevik Revolution where they actively kick out and kill the Tsarists, the people who supported Nicholas, Nicholas II, moderate socialists and the Mensheviks, and capitalists uh, that existed there in Russia. They actively fought a civil war which was supported by the United States from, I think, 19, 1918 to 1922. Those, those years might be a little off, but it's just basically late teens, early 20s. Um, and we very much feared it. So where we're going to look is uh, we are going to fear anyone coming from Southern or Eastern Europe where ideas of communism and anarchy are the most prevalent. And anarchy is, is similar to communism. They kind of have the same goal. The end goal for both anarchy and communism is no governments and independent communes. So, they want to eliminate governments. Anarchists are a bit more violent in their, well, they're both violent, they both want violent revolutions, but they both want to uh, destroy and dismantle governments. So both of those are threatening to the idea of, well, social order, first of all, but certainly American ideals. Uh, so a lot of those anarchists and communists are present in Southern Europe and the Balkans, Italy, uh, as well as in Eastern Europe, out of uh, Russia and the other Slavic nations around them. So people fear uh, these guys participating. So we have a lot of 
what you would call, I guess, what's the word I'm looking for? Legal discrimination against communist or anarchist supporters. So you're much more likely to be searched, uh, seized and arrested without a warrant. Um, they're much more likely to watch you if you're part of like, if like if you're, for example, which is totally legal by the way, if you're like part of a communist party or something like that in the United States or a socialist party, they're going to watch you, perhaps illegally, with wiretappings, searches and seizures, arrests, when they don't really have a, uh, a reason to suspect you or a cause or a warrant. So you're going to have lots of um, those types of immigrants from Southern Eastern Europe or communist or anarchists having to endure that. And one of the best examples of that was um, the case of Sacco and Vincetti. So these guys, uh, by all accounts, are not what we call good guys, but they are two people who were convicted um, and found guilt, or sorry, arrested and convicted of uh, the murdering of a butcher or a baker or something like that. Mm -hmm. And... Um, tried with what looks like false or at least shoddy evidence, convicted and uh, executed uh, for their participation in this. And a lot of people believe, probably rightfully so, that they were targeted and persecuted because of their ties to anarchism, all right? Um, and again, these guys had a criminal record. They were not good guys, but in the United States, we're supposed to have that, you know, habeas corpus, uh, innocent until proven guilty sort of approach and it does not look like those guys got it, and they died because of it. So that is an example of where maybe a bit of irrational fear and certainly uh, a lack of procedural consistency uh, occurred. And this is going to rise again in the 1950s. It started the Cold War with McCarthy and blacklisting of certain people and all of these things with spy allegations. But uh, the first Red Scare in the 1920s definitely coincided with uh, the rise of the KKK and anti-immigration sort of fear of inferior genes and communists, socialists, and anarchists infiltrating the United States. So, not a good time to be any of these groups in the United States. Weren't Sacco and Vincetti, weren't they like immigrants too? And then people, uh, I forget what, what they were, but the people- Yeah, they were Italian-American immigrants, from yeah, what so I remember. Weren't they like but the, the thing that mattered was they were anarchists. Yeah, but weren't like some Italians or other like immigrants, weren't they saying that they were also like discriminating against immigrants or something like that? Sacco and Vincetti were? No, like how they did that, like how, because you know how they like didn't really have that much evidence behind it? Right, and, and, and it looks like they maybe faked some evidence. Yeah. Um, I saw a documentary that talked about it. I don't know how credible it is, but um, there's no question that this was a controversial conviction and execution. And these guys were almost certainly rushed to their deaths just because of their ties, um, their, their history of violence and political ties. Again, these weren't good, good dudes, but it, it does seem that they did not get their fair uh, uh, due process. <clears throat> and they died for it. So, that's the negative side of 1920s. I think that was it. National Orange Act, yep. Okay, that was the 1920s. Going forward with the Great Depression. We go to the 1920s? Mm -hmm. All right. All right, Great Depression is going to begin roughly in 1929. So I'm going to just talk about the causes, Keynes and economics, and then go right into New Deal stuff. Oh, you know what I did forget, though, actually? Is, I mean, how much is on it? Let me make sure there's not a whole lot. Yeah, there's not that much on it. Uh, I, I mentioned it briefly, uh, but because of a lot of instability uh, and economic depravity in Mexico, we do have a massive increase in uh, Latin American immigrants in the 1920s. A lot of them are coming in uh, to work agriculture as migrant workers, maybe even in factories. And so the KKK is going to be opposed to them as well because again, they're, they're pretty much anti-anyone that doesn't fit their uh, eugenics model and is competing with them for cheap labor. So they're gonna be anti-Catholic, Jewish, black, uh, and Mexican immigrant. And that really picks up in the 1920s, especially when we have a lot of fruit farming going on in Southern California. So like avocados, olives, oranges, etc., <clears throat> and other crops uh, in the South, uh, there are gonna be a lot of migrant workers coming up to do that. There still are, uh, but the process is gonna change uh, and in, the and in 1929, I think they 
officially make, I might be remembering this wrong, but I think in 1929 they officially made immigration that wasn't done correctly illegal. Maybe I wrote that down actually. Hmm. Maybe not, but yeah, I think it was like four or five times as many Mexican immigrants started coming in the 1920s, so just to make that a point. All right, Great Depression. <clears throat> It's going to go roughly from 1929, but the end of it, you could really just say 1930, but 1929 until about World War II is essentially the duration here, so a little over a decade, uh, with the lowest points coming in the early to mid-30s. <clears throat> so, how did we get here? Several factors. Overproduction is one, and that's in the fields of agriculture and manufacturing. And I talked about them before in the 1920s. So, two reasons for this. Machinery and new techniques, like uh, better tractors and equipment and the assembly line and better factory equipment, made production much quicker and cheaper. So they're able to make a lot more stuff. Everybody buys it, they use credit to buy it, and then pretty soon, either the prices are too high, no, let me backtrack that. People have too much debt, so they can't buy anymore, and these factories have a surplus, so they have to drop their prices, and it starts a sort of a, a negative feedback loop here. So we have a phenomenon known as deflation, and this is bad, I know it sounds good, because it's good if you're a buyer, a consumer, but it's really bad for business. So if I'm buying grain or radios, if the price goes down, that's good for me. Like, I save more money, I can buy more things, it's easier. That's bad for business, though. So if they're lowering prices, that means they're not selling enough, which means they're going to have to start laying workers off. Or perhaps they can't pay off the loans that they took for equipment uh, or to start their, their business. So this is a bad cycle if you're a farmer or a factory owner. And it's going to happen to both. It happens first in agriculture, but it also happens in manufacturing. So it's a slow process of too much production. So my supply is too high. I have a surplus. And a surplus is always going to result in a price decrease, and that's deflation. And that's bad, because if you have to lower your prices, that means you have to, uh, you're not selling enough. So I don't need to make as many, so I lay off some of my workers. Or if I'm a farmer, and I don't have workers, it's just me. If I'm making less money off of the grain I'm making, and I can't pay my bills, I just lose my equipment in my house. And that starts happening. Especially when farmers try to make up for their loss of money by making more stuff, like, oh crap. Well, grain's selling for less now, so I've just got to make more grain to make up for it. But what, what is the problem with doing that? If my problem is there's too much grain, so the price goes down, so to make as much money as I did last year, I have to make more grain, is that going to make the problem better or worse? worse. It's going to make it worse, right? The price is just going to continue to drop. So they're shooting themselves in the foot. So if you're a factory, you're laying off workers, you're potentially going out of business, those workers no longer have jobs, they can't buy stuff, so that just makes the problem worse and worse and worse. This downward cycle begins in the mid to late 1920s, where, again, factories are laying people off and closing, and farmers are going bankrupt and having to give back their houses and property and equipment. And again, anytime you're laid off or you go bankrupt, you're not spending money anymore, which slows the economy down further. So now businesses and, and uh, businesses and farms are getting less money again, which means you have to lay off more workers or you have more farmers going bankrupt, so it just starts that cycle going the wrong way. All right, and one of the contributors to this was credit. So credit, of course, is gonna contribute to people buying so much so quickly. And then, of course, people saturate themselves with goods. They have to pay back the credit. They stop buying, it starts the cycle up. That includes margin buying, by the way, because the stock market's gonna to crash too. 1929, it's called Black Tuesday, the day it happens. Uh, this happens because with margin buying, so many people bought stocks because every company was doing better that um, the prices just got way too high to buy. Like, I, I'd be happy, sure, that I bought you know a Ford stock at $1, now it's worth $10,000, but who's gonna be buying $10,000 shares of Ford? Like, that's an absurdly large amount of money. So once these prices due to the credit and this margin buying occur, people just stop buying those stocks. And that's really bad because number one, banks are investing in the stock market. So when that starts crashing, the banks start losing money. But also, 
If I borrow money to buy that stock, I'm in deep trouble. Because not only did I lose my money, but I owe money now. All of this is going to combine, whether it's farmers or businesses going out of business, or a stock market and banks losing their shares, all this is going to result in um, the closing of small banks. Large banks could take the hit and keep running. Small banks could not. If they don't have people paying them back because they went bankrupt or uh, they had stocks and lost the money, a bunch of money in the stock market crash, small banks begin to close. This starts a panic. This is called a bank run. Where people, when a bank closes, if I have money in there and the bank closes, goes bankrupt, my money just poof, disappeared. I don't get it back. So people are terrified when they start realizing these banks are going bankrupt. So they rush to these banks to pull their money out to keep it safe. But if you know anything about banking, there's way less money in the world than there is held in banks. So I know right now, I don't know what it was in the 1920s, but I know right now, for every $100 that you have in the bank, there only exists actually $3. So if everyone went to pull their money out, 97% of the money would not be able to be handed out. Um, so that's a problem. People run these banks, the banks can't hand out all the money, then the banks go bankrupt, and it just starts the cycle of banks closing. So we have a, a bank run, and then we have a large-scale U.S. banking failure. Nowadays, <clears throat> and we're not quite sure if this is the right thing or not, but nowadays if banks begin failing, the government bails them out, provides them with money and support so that this is kind of avoided. We did that in 2008. They paid it back pretty quickly because that's how profitable banks are. I think they paid back $800 billion in like, in like two years or something like that. Like that's how profitable they are. But um, might, have, might have been two years, whatever it was. It was a ridiculously <clears throat> short amount of time to make $800 billion. Um, we have a banking failure. And if you lose the banks, you're done. Because now nobody's loaning out money to start businesses or uh, farms, or pay for machinery, or buy stocks. So all economic growth is going to stop and reverse. And this is where we have the Great Depression, because all of these people, whether you lost your life savings, you lost your business, or your farm, or whatever, or just your job, now you have nothing. You are unemployed, and there's no other jobs for you to take, because these places are all closing. So the problem we have here with this Great Depression is mass unemployment. <clears throat> Um, depending on your area, you had upwards of like 60% of people without jobs in some big cities or in some cities. Uh, but the highest average was 25%. I think that was in 1933, don't quote me. But, and that's one out of every four people doesn't have a job. Like unemployment right now, for, for example, is like 3 or 4%. And that's because people are choosing not to work or they're in between jobs. Like, oh, I don't like this job, I want another one. They quit and find another job or whatever. Um, but this is absurdly high. And this is a problem, because once the cycle starts going in reverse, it's really hard to stop it, because, I mean, who's going to open up and start new businesses for jobs when banks and businesses are doing so bad and closing? Uh, so this becomes, the United States gets stuck in this, and it becomes a massive, uh, massive problem. So, the first president who's in office to try to deal with this is a guy named Herbert Hoover, a Republican. <clears throat> And he is a very pro-business, laissez-faire capitalist. So if I'm a laissez-faire capitalist and there's a market dip or recession, do I want to involve the government to fix it or do I want to let the market fix itself? The market. Yeah. You want the market to fix itself, which could potentially work. I mean, capitalism has its cycles. This is a really bad one, obviously. Um, but doing nothing looks really bad politically. So, while Hoover does advocate things like uh, charities for support, uh, or family, community, church help, he does not want to use the government, not government, to fix. Uh, he does use some infrastructure projects, like building of dams, like he builds Hoover dams and stuff, but for the most part, it's pretty low, low budget, low scale, some infrastructure projects for jobs, but they're pretty low scale, like Hoover's Dam is an example. Hoover Dam. For the most part, at least during his tenure, this is not going to solve the um, economic crisis, the depression. 
he becomes extremely unpopular because again, we realize he was operating in a manner with the theory he believed would work. But when your approach is to do as little as possible to fix the problem, that's not going to get you reelected. And it doesn't. It paves the way for a new guy who has a new plan, a new deal, uh, to fix the economy, and that is Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And he's a Democrat. And he's going to alter politics, actually. He's not going to fix the Great Depression. Uh, that is a complete bit of information, misinformation. Uh, I remember hearing this from like my junior high high school teacher. I'm like, oh yeah, and then I you know, get to high school and college, and I find out, oh, well, that's not true. Uh, but he does not fix the uh, Great Depression, but he does realign politics. So, he's a Democrat, and he is going to uh, lose the South, because that's traditionally been a Democratic stronghold, and we kind of have a flip here, uh, politically. We have a flip in that the North and Midwest had largely been Republican, and now we're going to have, uh, and the South was Democratic, and now we're going to have a, a shift where most urban environments and, and, and uh, places with high po minority populations become Democrat, and the more rural um, areas become Republican. So we'll talk about that uh, as we go. So FDR's new plan was loosely centered on a new series of economic theories. These were the theories of a guy named uh, John Maynard Keynes. He devised Keynesian economics. This is also known as demand-side economics. And his theory was this. So the problem here is mass unemployment. So if I could find a way to get people jobs again, what do people do when they have money? They sit on it? No, they spend it. Right, which is what you want to happen. You want them to get money, spend it, businesses to grow, hire more people, then they businesses pay them, then more people have more money, and they spend more, and they you know it starts that cycle of economic growth going. So he he figured correctly that if the problems unemployment, if we could somehow provide employment to people, that would start reversing the cycle and fix the economy. Again, that's called demand side economics. The idea here is we're lacking demand. Right? There aren't enough jobs, so people don't have money, so they can't buy anything. They can't spend money. There's no demand for the market. That's why it's called demand-side economics. So, the idea here is, let's try to provide jobs. So here's Keynesian economic theory. So it's to provide jobs through government deficit spending. I'm oversimplifying, but the general idea here is, no one has money at the, mo at the moment, so the government is going to have to provide jobs for people to get the economy going again. So the idea is the government borrows money from banks, from the Treasury Department, and from uh, other countries, and they start large-scale uh, public spending. So that could mean infrastructure projects, like building of roads, highways, bridges, dams, etc., uh, or working in national parks, which is like the, what the civilian... Uh, Conservation Corps is going to be. Uh, or military spending. Uh, the Nazis were actually going to use both of these to reinvigorate their economy in the 1930s. Um, obviously, they did a lot of things horribly, but one thing they did do well was re jump jumpstart their economy back in the 1930s by militarizing and uh, building a lot of stadiums and freeways and highways and things like that. So... Americans are going to kind of start to adopt some of these as well. It's a British guy, but they're going to adopt some of these. So again, idea. Uh, use the government borrowing money to build lots of start infrastructure projects and military expansions so people have jobs, they get paid, they spend money, and hopefully that sparks the private sector. So we have more businesses opening up, more farmers, etc. And that way, it starts the economy back up, and then... The idea is the government's supposed to back off. Government backs off as economy recovers. Right, and the whole point here is you wanna pay the debt back. Right, so the United States starts doing this, we just never get to that last stage. We, uh, we just keep deficit spending. So that's why we have a 21 something million trillion dollar debt right now is because we just never really stop this, at least not entirely, or for a long period of time. So that's the Keynesian economic problem, or solution.
provide employment to the government by borrowing money. Once the economy becomes, begins to recover, the government backs out and starts paying back its debt. All right, you guys, you guys got that? All right, let's you catch up on the writing for a second. Space actually, I'm move it over. All right, so the New Deal. This is Franklin Delano Roosevelt's proposal to Congress because the president, they can enact executive orders, and they do, like 9066 that in turn puts all Japanese Americans in internment camps during World War II. That's a bad one. But uh, the one that passes sweeping laws and reforms. Uh, that comes from Congress. So FDR gets his coalition in Congress uh, to toe the line to try to fix this um, economic depression. And the New Deal is a whole bunch of laws that are what we call interventionist. Meaning, the government involves themselves in economy and people's lives. So this is the first large-scale interventionist program. So, some examples of that. Let me make sure I didn't skip anything, first of all. Nope. We're on track. Okay. So, part of this New Deal is going to be to try some Keynesian economic theory here. So they're trying to provide jobs to people through government spending. So we do have some infrastructure projects and programs. Uh, for example, we've got the Civilian Conservation Corps. It's basically for young unmarried men. And the idea here is the government is going to fu uh, provide funds for them to uh, work on uh, conservation projects. So they're the ones building roads and bridges and things like that, national parks and uh, across the country. Uh, they employed like three million some people, I think no more than like 3,000 at a time. Um, and they're credited with, I mean, most people think that this program was not a success, but at least at the time, they tried to push the fact that these men were happier, healthier, more well-built, and more employable for the future. Uh, although there's a lot of debate and support uh, to show that Civilian Corps was not very successful, at least not, at, at least not for the money and effort put in uh, as for what it produced. You also have government institutions uh, like the Tennessee Valley Authority, which was basically a government uh, power station or company. So they, they of course, funded and had uh, power stations and production and plants um, built and run. And then uh, the people that were building and running those were, of course, paid by the government and provided with jobs uh, to do so. We also have, this is, this is not Keynesian economic theory. These are Keynesian-ish. This is not Keynesian economic theory. This is, uh, so we'll put Keynesian. This is more aid for the poor. So with the expansion of programs like, like basically like food stamp welfare programs type things, so expansion of poor aid. So the beginnings of things like food stamps <clears throat> and welfare. <clears throat> we also have the, uh, Failed program, it will certainly fail most likely in the next couple decades, of Social Security. And the idea here is, it's like a government pension program, kind of, where you pay a portion of your wages for your whole life until you hit, <clears throat> depending on, well, you can withdraw at different ages, but basically around 60, um, you can retire. And instead of paying into Social Security, which the government's holding on to, they pay you like a fixed amount each month. And that's supposed to act as a retirement fund. Now, the amount of money is actually pathetic. You won't be able to live off of it. But it is a way to try to provide for people who are poor uh, and retired. So that is what Social Security is, kind of like a, a pension program. The reason why it's going to fail is the government's tapped into it too much for other programs, and 
when these baby boomers start retiring in the next five to 10 to 15 years, uh, that's gonna be way too many people withdrawing from the program and not enough people putting into it. So you're gonna see likely a reduction amount that they're paid, an elimination of the program, and almost certainly we'll see a rise in social security taxes for those of us still working. So hooray for that to look forward to. All right, and those are, there's more, but these are some general policies employed by providing employment and providing aid to the poor. And again, none of these actually fixed the uh, uh, Great Depression. In fact, this ran a large, large debt for the United States from the 1930s. What is under the CCC? Tennessee Valley Authority. Government Power Station Company. Oh. <clears throat> I'm oversimplifying most of these just for the sake of review, but that's essentially what there was and the role. You guys didn't talk about that in A-Push? No, we did. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Another thing that they're going to pass is FDR is going to really open things up for unions and strikers. So in the, like the 19th century, the 1900s, um, strikers and unions had a hard time because either their operations were illegal or their strikes were illegal um, and they could be persecuted by the companies. However, in 1935, we're going to have the Wagner Act or Wagner Act. And that's going to allow uh, unions to operate much more easily in the United States. It essentially gives unions rights to assemble and strike and negotiate. So that is going to be union rights. <clears throat> and that again means it's legal for them to organize, organize strikes, and negotiate with employers. And unions operate kind of like Social Security, basically. You pay unions a little bit each month, they pull the money together uh, to fund people to work on your behalf, hire lawyers, pay for programs, things like that. All right. As a result, by the way, you're going to have an expansion, of course, in unions. Uh, while the AFL is going to fall out of popularity, um, you are going to have, within the AFL, a committee of industrial organization. They're going to form in 1935 as well. And these guys are going to be focused more on using workers together, so skill and unskill, but also they're going to be much more inclusive with regards to uh, minorities and women. So it's not going to be just these segregated sort of unions, but rather it does a much better job of uh, being open to blacks, women, skilled and unskilled laborers. Um, and when the AFL is going to start to oppose that uh, and lose favor, the Committee of Industrial Organizations is going to become, I think, the Congress. Yes, the Congress is going to form its own organization or group. Ian, is it 37? 38. 1938. And again, their MO here is skilled unskilled minorities and women. So you see a rapid increase in labor, uh, or sorry, uh, union participation. I think it more than doubles. Yes, so from 1935 to 1941, you see a rise in union membership going from 3 million to 8 million. And that's a lot. This, by the way, is part of the reason why the Great Depression endured, because it's really hard in a depression for employers to pay employees more. Because the problem is already that they're struggling or going out of business. So it makes it, it, makes it quite difficult. But I mean, I mean, it makes sense, though, because the workers want to protect their jobs and their wages because there's a depression. But it, it's harder for the employers. It's bad for everybody. That's why depressions suck. I would try to avoid them. <laughs> that kid sounds happy. <laughs> Okay, any questions about these um, <clears throat> unions? Okay, let's talk about the last part of the Great Depression, which is the debates 
on this Great Depression. Because there were, it, it was mostly supportive, right? You had Democrats um, that dominated Congress uh, in pretty much every position at the time, because Republicans, again, seemed like they were unhelpful. Um, but we did have some opponents. So we had, what's his name, Al Smith? I forget, I'm looking real quick. Yep, Al Smith. Opponents of the New Deal. Their main criticism was that these policies were too interventionalist. Like, these were basically socialism and communism creeping in. Uh, it wasn't strong enough that they formed uh, opposition groups like the Anti-New Deal, American Liberation League, we'll just put Anti-New Deal League. Anti-New Deal League. But there just wasn't enough popular support for this because people were had been suffering for years and they wanted, they thought the current approaches were not working and they wanted a, a change. So they didn't know if it was going to be good or bad, but they, that's what they wanted, what they were looking for. All right. <clears throat> but like I said, uh, Despite that observate or sorry opposition from conservatives, I should put that by like conservatives. It's not going to be enough. You also had some opposition though from uh, radical leftists, right? We always fear radical anyone's, um, particularly radical leftists. Um, but especially right now, uh, radical opposition. They basically thought that these policies didn't go far enough, so they opposed the New Deal as well as being too soft. So these thought this was too socialist. And radicals thought it wasn't socialist enough. So this would be like the current radical leftists that criticize the current... So like the current Democrats right now are being criticized heavily by radical leftists like uh, AOC and Ian Amon and uh, what's the other one? There's another, the other female House member. The one who said, we're going we're gonna to impeach this mother effer about France or uh, about Trump. Whatever, I can't remember that name. The, those are the ones that, that try to do... A, whole bunch of stuff really fast and are extremely critical of anybody that opposes them. So the radical leftists back then were guys like Upton Sinclair <clears throat> and other anarcho-communist socialists who, of course, wanted no government or regulation. They wanted communal and worker-run factories. So this is some of the stuff that they wanted. They wanted worker-run communal Factories. Uh, what else did they want? Oh, there's one other absurd thing they wanted. Oh, nationalization of banks. They want to know private banking. So they really did want to go socialist. So, opponent. Uh, uh, sorry, opponents. We have the conservatives and the radical leftists. So conservatives say it's too socialist. Radicals say it's not socialist enough. They wanted communal worker-run factories and nationalized banks. And conservatives, of course, wanted to maintain a more laissez-faire approach. <clears throat> was Upton Sinclair part of the anti-New Deal League? No, this is a conservative group. Okay. As far so far as I know. Okay. I, I don't know why he would ever align himself with like conservatives at that point. Oh. On on this topic at least. He might find some sort of alignment on another issue, but not on that. Okay. Um, is that everything? The last thing I want to say is, because of this approach here about including, you know, it's more of a social justice view on things, and of course back then it's appropriate too, because they still have segregation of the workforce from women and men and all that, or, and uh, minorities. Uh, so this is a point where we have... We have a realignment in the United States politically. Now, the party names stay the same, but the people that support them are going to shift, or at least begin shifting uh, after FDR. So politically, we have, and again, a lot of it's due to the fact that their support of the working class and women minorities means that the Democrats sort of usurp or take over the role as the um, pro-working class take pro-working class slash minority slash women party. And they're obviously trying to hold on to that even to this day, even as they become actually racist and sexist in their policies and trying to achieve equality. Meaning like, you know, they want uh, 
men in certain racial groups reduced or eliminated in, in businesses uh, directly to try to make it more equal by number. Um, but back then, they were definitely right in their cause to open up opportunities for working class people to work together and negotiate, open up for minorities to take part in politics and the economy, and same for women. So Democrats very rightfully took that flag of uh, being the sort of anti-oppression, pro-social justice party. Uh, and we do have a realignment politically where the working class, blacks and the minorities, and women sort of begin to identify with the Democratic Party. Whereas before, the party of anti-oppression and freedom was definitely the Republican Party. Right? They were the abolitionists, they were the uh, pro-first wave feminists, and then we kind of see a shift here uh, during the uh, Depression, the Great Depression, the New Deal. You guys got it? Yeah. All right. There we go. World War II, 1939, well, 37 kind of, but it's 1945. So the U.S. is going to largely stay out of this thing at the beginning because we are in the middle of the Depression, and we, uh, well, it's a little more, but we're in a Depression, and we want to maintain our isolationist policy. So we are definitely opposed to the fascist totalitarian regimes of um, Mussolini and Hitler, and even the, the totalitarian communist regime of Stalin. <clears throat> so we largely stay out of this conflict when it starts in Europe in 1939 as another European war uh, between Germany, <clears throat> Nazi Germany, who's going to uh, conquer an ally, uh, occupy France, fighting Great Britain and the Soviet Union. Uh, we are going to be drawn into the war, though, when we are attacked by Japan. So we'll talk about why we're attacked by Japan, our response to that, and how we were kind of helping out the allies, in this case the USSR, our communist foe, and uh, Great Britain before the war started. So, World War II, a little lead up to it. Uh, if you want to know about World War II starting in the European theater, uh, my AP Euro video, of course, or AP World video covers that. Um, we're just going to talk about that already going. <clears throat> in Japan, though, is where we're going to look for a second. Because if you guys remember back in 1853, we forced Japan to open and they became humiliated and wanted to copy us and imperialize Asia. This is them realizing that goal. So this is where they <clears throat> begin the operation of removing the West from East Asia and they themselves becoming the imperial rulers of that area. And that's the goal. So <clears throat> in 1937, we have the beginning of the second Sino-Japanese War, which is Chinese-Japanese War. What the Japanese do is in Manchuria, they essentially uh, fake a Chinese nationalist bombing of their railroad, use it as an excuse to invade and defend that railroad, and then use that fighting as an excuse to invade and occupy the rest of China. And this is something that, um, <coughs> especially, as a member of the League of Nations, where you're supposed to be peaceful uh, and not invade, uh, they are going to uh, continue to do this anyway uh, at the protest of Great Britain and the United States. Particularly after we hear about some of the atrocities they commit, like for example the uh, Nanking Massacre, which is of course where you have tens of thousands of Chinese uh, killed brutally, raped, murdered, um, stolen from, mistreated, and that information does get out uh, to the greater world. So people are well aware of the atrocities <clears throat> that the Japanese are committing. And of course you also have in World War II, you have the uh, Holocaust. That's not going to be public information for quite a while, but that's also going on. And this is a, another reason why it was so easy for people to identify good and evil in, the, in World War II. Now, the USSR was definitely evil with the way they treated people and with the Great Purge and the Gulagization and all that stuff. But uh, during World War II, the clear bad guys, or the bad side, was uh, Hitler and the Nazis, and then uh, Imperial Japan as well, as far as how they treated people. So, <clears throat> we begin to work against this side before actually involving ourselves in the war in two ways. We indirectly, well, indirectly, help out Great Britain and the Soviet Union against Hitler with programs <coughs> like the uh, Lend-Lease program, No U.S. soldiers involved in this one. The Lend-Lease program is essentially... <coughs> man, I got a throat tickle. The Lend-Lease program is essentially where we lent them supplies and ships and things like that in exchange for leases on military bases. So we gave aid to Britain. 
uh, in exchange for military bases in like um, throughout the world, the Pacific, the South Atlantic, in Newfoundland, uh, Canada, etc., places like that. Um, we also have the cash and carry program, uh, which are essentially cash payments for again supplies and ships and things like that as well. So we're providing aid to them <coughs> and support. We also allow volunteer soldiers to go and fight for the UK, uh, things like that. So it's it's as indirect and uh, neutral as possible, but still specifically providing aid to who we feel, correctly feel, are the uh, good side in this conflict. <clears throat> All right, we also, oh, good. Didn't the Lend-Lease program, like, wasn't, like, Congress against <coughs> it, and then, so then that's why the cash and carry program happened as well? I'm not, I'm not sure the details on that one. I always just kind of skip over this one because it's not super important, but it's important to know that we were helping before we are actually involved. <clears throat> but yeah, I don't know the details on on Congress uh, opposing or or supporting uh, which one of these, but I'm sure I'm sure that's what you learned. That's probably right. All right. Um, so what was I saying? Oh, I guess the Japanese. We were very much opposed to their expansion in Asia, uh, in China, as they attacked in the Second Sino-Japanese War, took the coastal cities, and were constantly combating with the uh, um, Chinese on the interior of China in the mountains. As you guys don't know, almost the entire Chinese population is on the coast. In the coastal cities, there's very few in the deserts and mountains and the interior. Uh, so that's where the opposition and resistance resided for the most part. So to combat the Japanese, we uh, largely, along with the uh, British, um, cut off their oil. Because Japan has no natural oil supplies. Uh, notice, neither does China, by the way, for the most part. So the only oil that the Japanese have access to come from the United States and British, British's control and influence of the Middle East. Uh, and there is some access to oil in the uh, South China Sea, uh, Indian Ocean, um, well, West Pacific region as well. That, however, is largely controlled by the British and the Dutch. So Japan is going to have to imperialize the West Pacific if they want access to that oil. All right, because we have an Anglo-American oil embargo in 1940-ish. Three hundred forty. I think it was forty though. I think it was forty-one. I did 41. <clears throat> Regardless, we'll just say 40 or 41. And at this point, the Japanese decide, well, we've got about six months of reserves, and we're either going to run out and be stuck, or we're going to have to take some access to oil from our Western opponents. And they're going to, of course, opt for that uh, latter option and seek to move out those Western uh the Western presence there. So the biggest Western presence in the West Pacific, because Europe's embroiled in World War II, like for example, um, the uh, Dutch colony in Indonesia, the Dutch East Indies, I mean, the Netherlands are currently occupied by the Nazis, the British are locked in battle uh, with um, the Nazis across the um, English Channel, all supplies and resources are pretty much going there. So they have very little uh, to defend their holdings of like Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, the Dutch East Indies, even uh, Burma and India have very little in the way of resistance. Uh, so the door's kind of wide open, except for one country's presence here in Guam and uh, the Philippines, and you could say Australia too. Uh, but up here, we have the United States for the most part. So the biggest deterrent to your Japanese expansion is going to be the U.S. Navy in the Pacific because the Europeans are just so preoccupied with World War II. So the uh, Japanese decide, all right, well, we got six months of oil. We're not going to leave China. So we're just going to take the Western Pacific holdings of the West and uh, seize the oil that way. And the biggest threat there, of course, is the U.S. Navy. So they try for a war crippling, war ending attack on the U.S. Navy, Navy, trying to catch us off guard, and they do at Pearl Harbor, where most of the Pacific fleet is stationed. And that is December of yeah, 7th of 1941. Uh, that's the day they attacked Pearl Harbor. <coughs> the embargo is 41. It was 41, yeah. I figured since it's six months, it had to be 41, but I didn't know if the idea for it was before that or not. So we'll just put 41. <coughs> All right, so uh, there was early radar, but we weren't used to it yet. Uh, you couldn't really tell the difference between a flock of birds and enemy planes. 
Um, so despite there being a late warning, because they found that the Japanese fleet was on the move, and the Japanese, by the way, were having peace talks with us at that moment, um, they do try to attack Pearl Harbor. There's some mistakes they make. I'll write up here, but I'll tell you. They didn't hit the oil uh, reserves that we had there in Hawaii, so if they had hit our fuel supply and nothing else, that probably would have been as or more crippling than anything they could have done. Um, the repair, the capacity for Americans to repair the ships, the repair shops, et cetera, were largely untouched, so we repaired a lot of the damaged ships pretty quickly. Uh, and a little turn of luck, all three of our aircraft carriers were out of um, port at the moment. So if they had knocked at our aircraft carriers, we'd have been in a lot worse shape. Because I believe at the time the Japanese had four, we had three, and within a few months we'd be building 10, and Japan only had the capacity to build one or two. So this was a critical moment where if we had lost aircraft carriers, the Japanese could use their aircraft carrier advantage to just sabotage any attempts by ourselves to build um, aircraft carriers, because you have to build them by the ocean. I mean, you can't move an aircraft carrier from land. You have to build it in the water already, essentially, or right next to it. So the Japanese could easily just prevent us from building other aircraft carriers if they destroyed ours, um, which is why Battle Midways would be so important later on. So anyways, head us Pearl Harbor, and simultaneously, they take out Hong Kong, Singapore, the Philippines, uh, they go for Guam, and uh, the other holdings shortly after. And very, very, very quickly, the Japanese control China, Southeast Asia, uh, the Pacific Islands, and they pretty much have a stranglehold uh, on the West Pacific. All Westerners are killed, captured, or escape, and uh, the Japanese have their imperial holdings. So in 1942, it looks really bad, because Hitler owns almost all of Europe, the Japanese almost all of the West Pacific, um, but the advantage for the Allies is twofold, technology and production. So the longer the war goes, kind of like the Civil War, the longer the war goes, the more it favors the Allied powers. Uh, just like the Civil War, despite the South's early advantage, uh, militaristically, the longer the North holds on, the better the war is going to go for them. Because they have more people, more supplies, more money, they can survive a much longer conflict. All right. That's how we get involved. Any questions about that? Cool, we'll do a quick rundown of our interventions, technologies, and uh, that should be it for WW2. All right, so sequence of events. I already just discussed how, for the most part, Nazi Germany occupied and their ally in Italy occupied almost all of Europe, except for Great Britain and the Soviet Union, although the Soviet Union was backed up to its last three major cities at Stalingrad, Leningrad, and Moscow. So it looked pretty bad. So Nazis, Japan, um, and they really hadn't lost yet by 1942. Like, it's just been WWWW for the Axis powers, which of course Germany, Italy, and Japan. And uh, it looked pretty bad. However, a few advantages we have, technologically. Radar and sonar. We are able, along with the British, to see submarines and planes before they arrive there. And that's huge because we can now combat German U-boats or submarines. And also, a big part of aircraft warfare is knowing when the aircraft are gonna arrive. Because if you know they're coming, you can have your planes in the air to combat them, as opposed to having your planes on the ground and they just bomb them before they ever get off the ground. All right, that's what the Germans did the Polish uh, in 1939. Like the, the Polish planes pretty much never even got off the ground. The Luftwaffe just swept in knocked whatever remnants of an air force they had out before they even got off the ground, and that was it. So, radar's gonna allow us to see planes coming is especially important for Britain. Get their planes in the air to fight the fighters, take down the bombers, and then, like I said, having an aircraft, an air force is useless if it's on the ground, they just bomb it or shoot it down before you even get off. So that, that's huge, those two. Uh, and also, the Polish resistance steel, this is complicated, Steal an, uh, an Enigma machine, that's the code, the code German. language of the Germans. It, it's unbreakable. There's millions of combinations. They change it every day. But since they stole a machine, got it to Great Britain, and literally invented a computer to break this code every day because they knew the last phrase of every telegraph was Heil Hitler, they're able to uh, break this code every single day and start seeing what the Germans are doing. <clears throat> so we break the codes, code breaking. Americans break the uh, Japanese code and the, uh, the combination of the Allies and some new technologies 
are going to break the German code. So we actually know what they're doing for the most part. So one thing we find out is we find out the Japanese. So we got Pearl Harbor here in Hawaii and Midway, which is the last U.S. base about halfway across the Pacific, hence the name Midway. We know the Japanese fleet is coming there. They've got all four of their aircraft carriers. So we have an advantage of catching by surprise, and we send our three aircraft carriers plus the planes we already have on site in Midway, and it's kind of an evenish fight. And we know they're coming, and they don't know we're they don't know we know. So at Midway, even though it's pretty close initially, we do catch them and sink all of their aircraft carriers, or at least all but one. I think all four Japanese aircraft carriers go down, and we only lose one, I think. Uh, we have damage, but they're repaired, so this is huge because we are building 10, and they are building, I think, one. So again, if they wipe us out here, they can go sabotage our construction and make it really hard for us to ever oppose them, but fortunately, for us, it doesn't go that way. We destroy theirs, only losing one, but that's not, that's inconsequential because very quickly we're going to vastly outnumber them in terms of aircraft carriers. Aircraft carriers are huge, by the way, because it used to be ships would have to see each other to shoot. Nope, now you can send planes out hundreds of miles to shoot down and sink fleets or bomb towns that you can't even see the ship where it is. Like, one of the first things we do after we're bombed in Pearl Harbor is we have what's called the Doolittle Raid which is aptly named because it did very little. <clears throat> but it sort of like, I guess, scared the Japanese a bit because we ran, this is really risky, I don't know why we did this actually. We ran one of our aircraft carriers, which we very much need, uh, close to Japan, got spotted, got terrified, sent planes out, bombed Tokyo, and then just tried to crash land in China. A lot of the pilots didn't even make it. So um, I guess we kind of did that out of spite, probably not a good military idea. But um, yeah, aircraft carriers are important because it showed you could destroy entire towns and fleets without even knowing where the enemy ship was. So it's pretty, uh, pretty advantageous. So radar code breaking. We have the Battle of Midway here. That's a huge turning point in the Pacific in 1942, as well as the destruction of most of the um, Japanese fleet, at least the bulk of it, at the Battle of Guadalcanal with the forces of Australia and the United States. And that's in 42 or 43, it's pretty pretty soon after. Okay, so what happened to that, that, that aircraft carrier that, that brushed by Japan? Uh, it got away, as far as I know. But like, I know they got spotted early by some Japanese ship and they had to go. So they sent off the ships much earlier. I mean, it's in Pearl Harbor, like the actual movie. So they sent the planes out early without weapons. You know, like they had to make the plane lighter to save the fuel, so they like, they like cut off the, the weapons, the machine guns and things like that, and just took off with the bombs, bombed Tokyo, scared the Japanese, and then flew off and tried to make it to China, where a lot of them were, I mean, the Japanese controlled the Chinese coast. Like the whole point was to fly inland to where the Chinese resistance was, but they had to crash land essentially on the coast, which is where the Japanese were. So uh, I think a few of them got to Russia, which is better, but they never released the Americans. Like, it took them a long time to actually end up getting home. So, yeah, it was, it was, uh, I don't know, it's not a very good military plan, but they did it anyway. So, anyways, in the Pacific, we went at Midway. I'll write that down. Turning point. In the Pacific, Midway, Guadalcanal. And at that point, the uh, Japanese have no capacity to engage in aggressive combat. At this point, it's just... The U.S. using a tactic called island hopping uh, to skip unnecessary or overly, I guess you would say, defended Japanese islands and just essentially leave them there to uh, uh, starve out and surrender. Um, and they eventually get to the more bloody battles in the Pacific, which are the island battles of Iwo Jima and Okinawa, uh, where the Japanese do defend brutally to the end. Uh, we do lose a fair amount of U.S. Marines in those invasions, but we win both of them. And at Iwo Jima and Okinawa, we now have access to Japan via island. Like, we're close enough to now fly bombers directly over Japan, and we do. We bomb their cities to rubble. To Tokyo is a shadow of what it used to be. So, when we develop the nuclear bomb, or the atomic bomb, with uh, the Manhattan Project, we don't bomb Tokyo because there's not much left of it. 
That's why we target uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Again, the Japanese didn't believe that we had this weapon at first. We said we have a super bomb, surrender now, or we use it. They didn't believe us, obviously. They, were, they probably would have surrendered, but in, initially they were debating whether or not to resist the Americans uh, from the uh, mainland of Japan. Of course, we would just continued bombing them um, and then eventually invading, but after the first and second atomic bombs, the Japanese just decided to surrender with these super bombs that destroyed entire cities. Um, so yeah, that hastened the end of the war in uh, the Pacific. That actually happened later. G Germany's going to surrender earlier. So here's what happens as far as Americans go in Europe. This is largely won by, well, the Americans is a lot, but the Russians, with the support of the United States, are able to overextend the uh, Nazis and win at Stalingrad. And there they're going to capture some of the best equipment and soldiers of the uh, German forces. Uh, Hitler ignores his general's warnings to retreat the area. Um, and then, of course, the, um, like the Sixth Army, I think it was the Sixth Army, whatever it was, basically some of the best troops that Germany had are captured here. Almost none of them survived. They were killed or sent off to the gulags to be worked to death. Um, and uh, that's going to be the beginning of the end for Nazi Germany because they're going to be overextended. They don't have access to oil, the supplies, their population is going to be depleted. The, uh, the oil stocked and supplied Russians are going to very determinedly uh, push the Nazis back over the next three years across Russia, the other Slavic areas of Poland, uncovering, of course, lots of death camps like, you know, Treblinka, Dachau. No, oh, actually, Dachau's in Germany, sorry. Uh, Treblinka, Kelmno, Auschwitz, the most, most popular one, or well-known one, and uh, push Germany all the way back uh, into surrendering and capturing Berlin in 1945. Uh, not without the help of the United States, though. We do initially have to focus on Japan, as they're the biggest threat to us. So, uh, at the bequest of Stalin begging for help, we first attack and invade in North Africa, where the Germans are. They're attempting to chase the British out and get access to oil there. So we chase the uh, Rommel, the Desert Fox, out of um, North Africa, and then we invade into Italy in 1942, but the Germans, despite Mussolini, you know, having to surrender and flee and then die, or sorry, try to flee and then be caught by his own people and hanged, the Germans actually defend Italy quite well. It's a really narrow, mountainous terrain, so it was easy for a small amount of Germans to hold up American forces for a long time. So we hold them up, they hold us up there for a long time. Stalin, by the way, detests our, you know, pitiful attempt to help them out in Europe at the time. And criticizes America. This is, by the way, going to sort of seed this deep distrust of the Americans. So I should actually write that up here. So this is Japan, or Asia. In Europe, the turning point is going to be Stalingrad, a Soviet victory. The U.S. does invade, like I said, North Africa and Italy. Stalin's not happy with it. It's somewhat inconsequential. Only minimal forces are used by the Nazis. They hold up the Americans for a long time. However, that's in 1942 and three. However, in 1944, June 1944, we have the D-Day invasion. And this is the big, the large scale one of British, American, Canadian, um, and Australian forces where we attack uh, from uh, Great Britain into uh, Normandy, France. And that is where the Americans have their first large-scale presence in Western Europe. It makes the war two fronts for Hitler, who is already losing, by the way, to the Soviets. Almost all of his forces are on the Eastern Front. Very little in the way of resistance for the Americans, British, and uh, Canadians, and Australians. And uh, that's, that, that's just it at that point. Less than a year, they're going to be in Berlin, there's one more attempt at an offensive called the Battle of the Bulge, which kind of catches people off guard, but for the most part, it's an inevitable sweeping of American and Soviet forces uh, to force Germany into surrendering, which they do in 1945, just a month or two. I think they were in May, and then the, Jer the Japanese surrendered in August. So uh, that is essentially the end of the war. Uh, they do want you to know the uh, name of the Manhattan Project. And the Manhattan Project, of course, is our nuclear, or sorry, atomic bomb development. Things to note from this, just like World War I, we have total war, 
right? Which means all of society geared to war. That means women in the factories, rations, um, the draft, as well as, well, I wrote women in the factory, factories, propaganda. We had, I think, over six million, six million plus women in workforce. So that's a lot. We do have a large amount of uh, blacks in the military too, but at this point, until the efforts of Philip Randolph and later uh, Harry Truman uh, implementing it, we do have segregation in the military. A black leader though, named Philip Randolph, is going to work to convince President Harry Truman uh, later though that um, the military should be desegregated. Rightfully so. All right. Um, so we had, I think, at the time, as far as women goes, this six million was about 37% uh, of women were actually actively working, or women that were working were working in factories. And uh, we had propaganda trying to get more women to join the workforce. You guys ever heard of Rosie the Riveter? Yeah. She's like that, you know, yeah, exactly, the flexing, like, bandana-wearing uh, chick on the poster, right? So there was a, a big part of the propaganda force was driven towards getting more females, men to join the army, and females to join, you know, as nurses, uh, as well as in the um, uh, factories. <clears throat> and again, oh, I mentioned that, by the way. Factories are going to be geared towards military production, so if I'm making refrigerators or cars, now I'm making tanks, guns, planes, etc., vehicles, uh, all of that to uh, fight the worker. Rosie the what? Riveter. Riveter. Like, she does the rivets on planes and things like that. Uh, some people call this the war of production, which is definitely won by us. The United States is the only country to really be untouched. Like, nobody bombs us. We pretty much just run our day. While, of course, we are fighting this war and geared towards it, nobody's bombing us. So our factories, our railroads, our roadways, our ports, all of them are running at maximum capacity. So with the U.S. being protected by two oceans and plenty of aircraft carriers, uh, we're able to just produce all the stuff we want. Um, so that does two things. Provides the Allies with way more equipment and fuel than any of the Axis powers, as well as employs Keynesian economic spending. So I do get like almost full employment in the United States. This is going to largely, it runs us up a massive debt, don't get me wrong, but it is going to get us and our economy back going again. So that's going to largely help bring us out of this depression. All right, one thing we should note here with the Manhattan Project, though, and the decision to bomb the Japanese is it's controversial because it is likely the Japanese would have surrendered without bombing them like that. Uh, but the U.S. wanted to end the war quickly for two reasons. Number one, they wanted to save American lives. And also, once the Nazis were defeated, Stalin's going to... What's the word I'm looking for? Honor his agreement to help the U.S. defeat Japan... However, at this point, we decide we don't want their help because we see what they're doing in Eastern Europe. They're essentially attempting to establish communist nations in Eastern Europe, and we don't want them doing that in Asia. So we want the war to end as quickly as possible so Russia takes less and less territory in East Asia. They get quite far already, though. They get into North Korea, which is why North Korea is still communist. They get into China, um, but we do end the war more quickly so that we are the ones occupying South Korea and Japan by ourselves. And as we'll see in period eight, in the areas with which we have authority, which is Western and Northern Europe, and Japan and South Korea, we are going to help install democratic free market, uh, sorry, democratic governments with free market economies. And the Soviets are going to, well, essentially force communist uh, nations authoritarian regimes in East Asia and um, in East Asia and Eastern Europe and Southern Europe. All right, that's going to be beginning the Cold War. And where we decide that we want to do that <clears throat> is the uh, Yalta and Potsdam Conference. This will be the last topic we talked about, I think. Let me just double check. Yes. So first, we have the Yalta Conference. Between the big three, 
So this is the USSR, Great Britain, <clears throat> and the US. The leaders meet, and here it's clear by 1945 that we're gonna win the war. Um, they meet in Yalta, which is then part of the USSR, like Crimean area. I think it's in January or February. It's 1945. And here they're, they're deciding, what do we do with these, new, with these governments that have been destroyed and replaced by the Nazis? And they decide, at least on paper, that they're going to allow these uh, nations, these former nations, to self-determine. Which means what? Uh, make their own government. Yeah, make their own government. Vote for their own government. Of course, neither side's going to truly do that. We don't do it by force in the West. We sort of economically encourage them uh, to go democratic capitalist. But the Soviets are going to straight force them to go communist militaristically by providing military and financial aid to the communist parties and enforcing, um, enforcing obedience to them. We also have the Potsdam Conference, which happens later, which, which is actually a different set of leaders. Uh, Stalin's still there, the USSR, but FDR dies before World War II ends, and Winston Churchill loses an election uh, to a new prime minister. So it's actually a new set of allied leaders uh, except for Stalin, USSR, Great Britain, and U.S. again. And this is 1945. They're meeting in Germany in Potsdam here because the war is almost over. And they're going to here discuss what to do with Germany. Here they decide to divide Germany into four military zones. There's a lot more they're deciding in these two conferences, by the way, but these are the only two things we really care about. Is in Yalta they decide... <clears throat> To self-determine the former territories and Germany, and in Potsdam they're discovering or discussing what to do with Germany. So they decide four military occupation zones, and they're going to allow the Germans also to eventually self-determine. Of course, none of those things are going to happen except for the four military zones. That is it for period seven.